Hi, everyone. Can anyone hear me? OK, I'll shout at you a little bit. Uh, so uh, first, I have to apologize. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm revamping this talk. So you're, I'm, we're doing a, an experiment. You might guinea pigs uh, for a new version of this talk, where I'm shifting a little bit the focus. I uh, have material for about two hours, so I'm showing every other slide. And uh, we'll, we'll see how we get through that. A uh, quick introduction, Daniel Rieck is my name, work at Red Hat in the CTO office. Um, I've been in Linux forever. Um, uh, I did a startup in the late 90s, and uh, I, I was the PM for RHEL uh, for you know, a long time. So a lot of experience with the operating system. I was involved in the um, container strategy in Red Hat. Um, now I focus more on machine learning, but I'll, I'll say how that's relevant a little bit. Um, the title of the talk, Grey Beards with Nightmare, uh, originally was inspired by, um, uh, by the, the Debian fork over systemd. Um, and the, yeah, what happened is that um, systemd changed how Linux works, right? It's a pretty big um, move away from Unix tradition um, to more actively managed operating system. And um, that was, for, for some people in the Debian community, that was too much change. And there was a fork of Debian when Debian accepted systemd. I think that has gone away in the meantime. And everyone has uh, accepted to live with systemd. Um, some of the things that we are doing to the operating system right now are bigger changes, and you know, so Linux is changing um, more than systemd did, and so you know, the 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 idea was, oh, this is this is even worse. So let's see what happens if if we introduce Kubernetes into the mix. So what's the traditional role of the operating system? Right, there are there are two views traditionally that you can find in 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 Red Hat definitely, or in general, right? There is the infrastructure up view. We say, oh, it's a hardware-centric view, right? We have an operating system in order to bring up hardware. And um, it, it ties, you know, the operating system, it's very kernel-centric, right? That's what talks to the hardware, and the, the purpose of the operating system is to make my hardware work. There's another view, which is the application-centric view which is a top-down view, and it's user space centric. It's the, oh, the operating system is what gives me a runtime environment for my application. Right. And, it, well, of course, the, the truth is it's both, right? The whole point of an operating system is to allow you to run applications on hardware or something like it, right? It's not hardware anymore, necessarily. Um, it could be a virtual machine. Um, but there's, there's always an intrinsic conflict between the two views because, you know, one view is like, do I tie my operating system lifecycle to the hardware or do I tie it to the, oper uh, to the application lifecycle and what's the ultimate purpose? And, um, you know, traditionally, you know, back in the day, um, this wasn't a big question because you had kind of a vertically integrated combination of hardware operating system and application, right? If you go back to the mainframe, it was basically, uh, you know, in the IBM model at least to, to some degree, uh, a black box application running on leased hardware, right? So you, you, you had access to an application that was very well integrated, it did what it needed to do, um, but you could never take the application to a different piece of hardware Right? Or you couldn't change the use of the hardware. You couldn't control how you use the hardware. It was vertically integrated. Uh, you put data in, and you never got your data out. Right? It was like it was a one-way uh, role. And even in Unix, uh, so-called open systems, you still had the integration of hardware and operating system. Right? So you know, if you had a Sun server, you had Sun hardware and a Sun operating system. And that was true for all the major Unix. Right? What Linux did, the role of Linux, was to break up this vertical integration. Right? With Linux, we got the ability to choose hardware that we like from multiple vendors, run Linux on top, and then choose um, software from an open, from an open ecosystem. Right? And that Linux wasn't the only operating system that had some choice. Windows had some of that. Right? But even in Windows, you had, um, the, the, you had the integration of one vendor with the operating system, Microsoft itself, 
right? And they controlled to some degree still what you could do, right? And they controlled the tool chains, they controlled um, what ISVs could do to a certain degree. Linux is the only thing that gave you full, at, at large, you know, in the mass market, the full free choice, both on the hardware and on the application, and provided a bi binary portability <coughs> to the degree that's possible uh, based on the, the hardware limitation, right? So it, it, you know, you can take one, one application on the source code level across different hardware architectures on the binary level within one hardware architecture, and you can take the application and run it everywhere, right? <coughs> And that is still the role of Linux today, right? It's a common binary runtime across, um, across hardware from different vendors, across virtualization, and across the public cloud. Right? That's why, why everything in the public cloud runs Linux, basically, nowadays, you know, because it, it gives you this abstraction. Um, and so, you know, so, so that, you know, that's always been what Linux did, and um, you know, there's the, the traditional model of I'm running, I'm running one machine. But we're seeing some shifting um, paradigm, some, some big trends, right? And, and so one, one thing we're seeing is that everything is software today, right? There is no business at large that doesn't depend on software one way or the other, right? Even, you know, any kind of, um, any kind of product, like, you know, a car today is a data center on wheels, right? And you don't even have to go to, like, self-driving cars for that. Like, any car has uh, a whole bunch of computers in there, and the functionality of the car is defined by software. Um, there is, the, you know, in the, in the whole um, electric car move with Tesla, right, um, what, what Tesla stated at a point is that their, um, their challenge or their competitive advantage wasn't the, the car itself, right? It was what's the electrical piece, but then the software to run the car, right? That's where the differentiation between cars happens nowadays. Um, so that shows you, like, the software is eating the world, right? Everything is software. Every business is driven, well, business value is driven by software. Um, and we have a fundamental change in how we, how, how we interact with, with things, right? So um, it's, like, when I grew up, well, we lived in a broadcast model, right? So, so they were, like, scheduled when things happened, right? And you watch TV, um, you know, when a show was on, Right, and you listen to radio where you had no control over the schedule. Right, so it was like a it was a, a, a life where you know what you could consume and how you could use things was relatively like controlled by others outside of your control. That has completely changed. Right, nowadays our expectation is that is um, things are always available when we want them. Right, the appification of the world. And that has not stopped, that, so that, that has happened in consumer things, but it also has happened in the software industry, right? And um, modern, um, because of everything depending on software, um, a model where like software is a one-way route, right, doesn't work anymore. Right? And um, most lines of business have their own software developers, right? So they're creating their own software. And their expectation is that the value they want to put in their business, you know, the, business the, the requirements to create the business values they want to create in software are always available, right? So it's, it's basically an appification. It's a, it's a consumer-centric um, idea. So a software, Software developer, if you go to a modern software developer in a line of business who is pressured to create business value for their company, which is not a software company in the traditional sense, right? It's some company um, building some consumer device. Um, they will not, when, when you go to them and say, oh, you have to standardize on this version of a library that has this limited functionality, while well, there is some newer version somewhere available, they will not understand what you're trying to do. They will not follow your standardization. They're going to try to consume the newest version of something that has the features that enable their business value, right? So that's an important um, problem for the operating system and the software stack, right? Because, um, you know, traditionally we try to standardize things and that has changed fundamentally. You know, there are other things, um, you know, the complexity of software stacks has grown, so we see an aggregation of services rather than monolithic systems. Um, 
and and you know and well, what's nice for us is open source has become the default um, for software, right? The the um, the, the, the differentiation of proprietary, so there's still proprietary software and it's of course always going back and forth, but at the core of most software systems today is open source, so that's the foundation for, for software. That's, um, that's become, and, and, and customers consume it that way and they understand open source, so we have a lot of um, interact with, with and, and, you know, some of you probably, you know, I'm, I'm talking a little bit from a Red Hat point of view because that's my world, but you know, many of you probably are in um, in non-software companies, right, um, and you understand open source, you interact with open source, even though you're not in a traditional software vendor, right? That's a fundamental change, and that's very common um, in the uh, with the customers that that I interact with. That they are advanced users of open source that actively contribute to open source, actively participate in open source, which. Um, which changes the dynamic, right? It's go, it goes back to, like, it, it also makes open source, from emulating a proprietary broadcast model of software, right? Um, open source business now has to, and, and, and open source systems have to understand this uh, value cycle of interaction with everyone in the value chain also contributing back to open source. Um, there are other changes, a move to cloud native behavior, and I'll talk a little bit about that, is a big change. DevOps, agility, those kind of models are changing how we treat software. Um, a big piece uh, you know, in all of that is software stack complexity. And you know, I, I pulled this yesterday from module counts. It's from the internet, so it must be true. Um, but you know, it, like, even if it's off, like, you know, so this is just a number of, of projects in common uh, repositories and these could all be for like forks of the same project um, but anyway, that's that's basically what the line of business developer pulls from right and um, you know if you see like npm is this like explosion right um, and and th that's that's a really interesting problem like right? so so I think in in fedora we have a reach of about thirty thousand packages and Debian has slightly more um, so that would be like somewhere, somewhere down here, right? That what, what we can package as binary packages. So there's no chance that, uh, that for example, a Linux distribution in a traditional sense can package all of this and make it available in the way we, have, we make available the core system software. Right? So that, that's an interesting change in how software life cycles work. Um, and, like, and so this NPM stuff is really interesting. Well, this is not just Node.js. That, that might actually, that's a good question. So th there is a lot of code in there that actually like isn't executed on the server, right? These are frameworks that put things that are executed in your web browser. Right? My whole my presentation is basically it's, it's Google um, slides I'm using, right? And that's basically a JavaScript app that's running in my browser <coughs> that's pulling code. Well, with Google they have pretty good controls over, it. but. Um, you know, in, in, the, in the traditional Linux model, what we s usually see is that um, you, you, you package software and it's on a server and the security problems are confined to the server, right? Which can have significant impact if that's insecure, right? But what we're seeing now is like the way that modern software works is that the browser itself downloads additional software packages when you execute an application. And so, like, so, so the, the whole like, concept of, of, of like, software main stability and, and security like, has a much bigger implication now. It's much more um, uh, uh, complex than what we traditionally had to deal with um, in, in traditional software, that which is like a server with a terminal or a local machine, a workstation. Right? Um, and so, um, and you know, the, the, I, I call that app, cen app centricity, right? So the, the one of the problems we're dealing with in Linux right now is that the, there's like a, a diminishing return um, on the you know against the complexity of software stacks, right? Because packaging everything in the Linux distribution works well for the core system. Right? Basically, the kernel glibc and the pieces you need, virtualization, the pieces you need around. But it doesn't, it can't keep up with the complexity and even the uh, um, con you know, use and deployment model of these complex application stacks today. Right? It just, you can't, can't keep up. And um, 
you, you know, everyone who develops software will go um, to the native package format for the software stack they're using, right? And which in NPM, you know, it's these NPM packages, then in the browser application, it's downloading random stuff sometimes. And, and like there's some, it, it, it gets really scary what, what you, if you go to, like to agency created or line of business created software and you watch what, what it's downloading, no one knows what's in there anymore. Right? Like, so no one can tell you where this stuff is coming from, what it does, um, in, in most cases. Right? Um, and, um, you know, in Go, it's all source code, and then, um, you know, that gets compiled into static binary, so, like, there's no way to know what the, what's in there, like, once you get it, right? So, there are, there are interesting problems in there where, where, like, what we did traditionally was packaging um, code in an RPM for binary distribution, Right, which was a, a huge step forward um, against the fragility of compiling things on each machine, but it, it's not sufficient anymore to keep up with this because you can't capture all of it. Um, another big change is um, that you know, in the modern world, like it, the cluster is a computer. Right, the, the whole concept of deploying an individual machine is not a reality anymore. No one, no one runs one machine. Right, um, if Sometimes you still look at an individual machine, but that's usually a virtual machine, right? Um, running on a cluster of virtual machines or in the cloud. In most cases, you basically look at services um, that um, that that um, you know, provide. So it's it's basically one service that gets deployed somewhere. That service might be implemented as a VM or as a container. Progressively, it's in containers. Um, and with, you know, with, with in, in Linux, that's where, where Kubernetes comes in, right? So um, the, the problem we have, you know, traditionally everything we have done in the Linux distribution is confined to one machine, right? That's how we looked at it. And so um, you, you had the special case of clustering. So, so systemd is a single machine um, orchestrator that takes care of your machine really well, but then, you know, when you cluster them, that becomes a special case and you have some failover, but there's nothing in there that takes care of like how, how do services move across multiple machines, how do you get connectivity. Right? And that's where Kubernetes comes in, and Kubernetes now has become the default orchestrator for services on Linux um, that uh, run, run in, in clustered services. Um, the, um, the, you know, the, it inherits um, the, the features from uh, Docker and or like Docker-like OCI containers, um, which, I'm sorry, I have to look at the time. <laughs> All right, so, so it it's built on uh, the container concept that was introduced by Docker first, uh, standardized in OCI, now implemented with Podman and and, and cryo um, in, in Red Hat's um, stack. Um, and what it does, basically, you can look at it, well, we sometimes call it a meta kernel, which of course is bullshit, but it's, it's more meta, meta system D, right? It, it orchestrates services across multiple machines and manages the cluster. And then on top of that sits services that, that orchestrate how you talk to the so service um, direction, service mesh, how calls get routed in that server. And um, what's, uh, you know, what's interesting in that is that it, it um, does two things. So the container concept encapsulates the dependency stack of an application into a namespace, um, which removes one of the biggest problems that, that you have in the traditional model of, of an operating system, which you, know, you can call dependency hell, right? So if you have, a, a, in the traditional single node operating system, you have one user space, right? And when you want to install things, they have to, uh, they cannot conflict in that user space, right? That's um, how we, how RPM works. Right? RPM solves that with its dependency management. But when you go into this model of many different package sources, um, that gets increasingly complicated. Right? Most of them have some way of um, isolating like virtual environments, but um, 
the dependencies on the underlying system then still need to be um, consistent or interdependent between these systems. And so traditionally that has been solved by running things in virtual machines. So you could do one virtual machine per service, but that's relatively expensive. So containers are a very nice lightweight way to give you a user space isolation to manage one service depend binary dependency stack in a nice way. And then Kubernetes gives you a way to orchestrate these together to serve applications out of a cluster, right? So bunch of things happening here, right? Move to from one server to a cluster of machines and uh, from kind of the binary, like one application binary interface to the operating system to abstracting that and splitting the operating system into the hardware piece and an application piece that lives inside the container and, and can move around. Um, so so the, the equivalent to the earlier picture, right, traditional, in the traditional server, right, we had Red Hat Enterprise Linux between the application and the infrastructure and the hardware or the virtual machine. And now in the new app-centric platform, we have Red Hat OpenShift, which includes Enterprise Linux, right? That's still, that's still the foundation for that. Um, so it's Enterprise Linux plus Kubernetes plus a bunch of other services that becomes a new abstraction layer for applications across the different footprints of infrastructure. Um, now, this uh, is happening in the context of cloud, right? And um, I, I talked a little bit earlier how cloud is changing how we do software. So to go a bit, a bit deeper, so the, the cloud, it's not only that, um, that clusters are the default. The default for most large customers today are cloud deployments, right? For new projects, um, if you're not in a regulated industry, um, then you default for new projects to the cloud in many areas. And um, there are a bunch of reasons for that, right? One reason is OPEX versus CAPEX, which I think is, is the, the least important one. It's, it's like it's from a budgeting point of view, it's easier to go to the cloud because you don't have to buy hardware with a long commitment. Um, the key points are elasticity and self-service. You can just go there and just do it. It's much easier to get a cloud instance than to go to internal process, even to get an internal VM in many companies. Uh, you just go there with your credit card and then the companies have to deal with that. Um, you can move up and down as you need, right? If you buy hardware in the traditions and moving down isn't really an option, you already bought the hardware. Cloud gives you the ability to reduce and be elastic. Um, the cloud has <coughs> managed to Establish data aggregation, all your data, and, and progressively today, um, you know, it's a separate topic that, that we have a whole thread on, is you know, the, the concept of intelligent applications, um, applications that, um, as uh, um, Will Benton defined that, for me, applications that uh, learn from data and improve their behavior based on data, right? Those applications need to live with data or need data access. The cloud allows you to aggregate data very easily. And so intelligent applications have a high affinity to cloud. Um, they are, the service the cloud provides great integration of um, different services. Um, they often have better security, right? So you can trust that Amazon's infrastructure is very secure. It's very expensive if you run your own infrastructure in a public facing way to keep it as secure as they will keep it for a whole bunch of reasons. You know. um, it's their core business, it's probably not your core business. Um, and they have operational excellence, right? They, they, because it's their core business to operate that cloud, they know how to operate that cloud. No individual company can compete with that directly, right? Um, they run everything as a service, right? So they provide predefined services. Um, they are now moving on-prems with a hybrid model. So even if you have things there, you say, oh, I need to keep certain data or certain processing locally um, for latency, for example. They have, um, uh, uh, for industrial IoT, for example, they have on-prem satellites now that you put in your, in your factory and they're basically part of the cloud, but local data is processed locally. So they move hybrid, which you know, removes a lot, is, is very attractive for large users that need the data aggregation, the central view, the integration. Um, and you know, the key, from my point of view, the key 
piece, what they're doing is uh, the service abstraction and, and time to value in the public cloud, right? The, the you interact, no, you, you, you can choose your entry level, right? Um, traditionally, like it was VMs, but now it's services, right? So you aggregate your data, your, your application from a bunch of predefined services and then you add the piece that, that's different for you. So you can focus purely on your own differentiation um, and you don't have to build all the other pieces, right? And, and that's, you know, you can focus on your core value. And I think, that, you know, the, the concept that like shows that the most is function as a service, so Amazon Lambda, um, where the platform, like you basically only deploy code snippets in a predefined framework now, usually for things that act on triggers, on, on data triggers and messaging triggers. Um, so you deploy only, like, you basically you don't have to, you don't even have to deal with the operating system or the software stack anymore, or the runtime, right? It's all predefined uh, that way abstracted and then it talks to, through a messaging bus through some other predefined applications. Um, so the, the, you know, that, the, 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 that gives you, you know, this level of service abstraction. You don't need to be an expert in any of these other things, right? You don't need a storage admin, you don't need an DBA, you don't need, uh, to in, you don't need sysadmins to install messaging, you can just use that. You know, in an environment where your data is already there and they give you this on-premise thing to aggregate your data and, and, and push some of these decisions locally. That's a very compelling um, value proposition, right? And, and that has changed how we look at software in general, right? Like, so, you know, traditionally it was what we call enterprise software. So someone writes software that someone else then deploys and the third person uses, right? Now with, with you know, everything being software, line of business having their own developers, we do people just writing applications on top of a, of a stack that is completely controlled and provided by a third party. Right? And so, so there is a big downside to the whole thing, right? and that is uh, the lock-in, it's black box services, you have life cycle dependency, data gravity, you can't get your data out once it's there, or it's very expensive to get it out. Um, you have no reproducibility because you don't know what these black box services actually do, right? You can't look inside. You, you, if, if they change how it behaves, um, you, you have no control. Um, in, you know, it's really bad for open source and, you know, probably a lot of you have, uh, have seen some of the um, uh, uh, fights over our licensing where like open source projects or companies that build on open source projects are changing their licenses to make it harder for the cloud vendors to offer their software as a service because um, there is no room for ISVs anymore in this model, right? Amazon, it's Amazon basically competes with the whole rest of the software industry. Yeah, at the end. Um, and, and so, you know, I said it's bad for open source, so who cares, right? Why, why does it matter if it's good for customers? Well, the problem is that there are, there are good reasons why you want open source, right? It's the transparency, it's uh, long-term strategic independence, it's innovation, right? And if you go into a monolithic system, you basically, re they basically recreated the mainframe, right? It's black box services running on leased hardware, right? That's, that's what they did. It has all the advantages that, the, that in the early days of computing the mainframe had, and um, you, know, you can just use it, you don't have to deal with it. It's very secure, very reliable, but it has also all the downsides. You're totally locked in, you can't innovate, you can't differentiate, you can't do things differently. And you basically, it becomes more and more expensive because you're in, a, in, a, in this dependency, right? So, um, so and, and uh, you know, a big conflict is like customers who want to have strategic independence who don't want to buy into this monolithic system and a choice of like four big vendors that are relevant right, right now um, uh, for all kinds of, <coughs> of reasons um, and the software vendors that are not one of the <laughs> four uh, big ones have a shared interest to find an alternative to that. Um, and what, you know, what are the challenges for that alternative? The big challenges is, is the service abstraction, time to value, that's the first one, right? If, like, if, if I go to a customer and say, okay, um, you want, you know, I, want, uh, I want to enable you to run things offline on premise, 
right? Not in the cloud. And you start with, well, you need to install Linux, and then you need to install uh, uh, your database, and then you need to install this and this and this, and I end up with this huge software stack that they have to maintain, they have to become experts in. Um, you know, they need to deal with storage, they need to deal with hardware. That's sometimes, that's a very tough um, uh, uh, value proposition. Right? Um, the sheer number of services that are easily available, right? I can just click a button and I can just deploy a service and I, I, it covers my whole application uh, architecture. Um, that's, that's a lot of work if you want to do that in the traditional model of you know, how we bought software traditionally. Right? Um, because you have to deal with five different vendors to get to the same. In Amazon, it's just one vendor you need to deal with. So that, you know, that's, that's a problem. Application portability, right? Like, if you go, like, can, I, can my application um, um, move between the, the cloud, right? So, so one of the big advantages of a third party model over a single cloud vendor is that if you, know, if you can take your application, move it from one cloud to the other cloud or on-prem, then you immediately are in a better negotiation position against the one vendor, right? So we need to provide um, application portability. And finally, we need to have the operational excellence. We need to make the operational excellence available to customers that Amazon provides as the benchmark, or the other cloud providers, I don't want to single them out. Um, but, but we need to make that available in a model where uh, the average IT company can, can or the uh, average IT department in an average company can operate their IT in a competitive manner, right? Which is really a hard challenge because, you know, the expertise is never going to be there, right? And in a way, you know, you can look at Red Hat's traditional business model as making, you know, make, using Linux to allow companies who couldn't, who couldn't afford a Sun server to run their IT like they could, right? That was in the early days was our business model. Uh, so it was about enabling people at a lower cost on PC hardware to do the same things that, that you know, the pros did in, in, in with Unix servers. Um, you know, at the end, like now our challenge is we need to enable the average IT department to run their IT like Amazon does, right? Um, so how do we do that? Um, so we think that Kubernetes is the answer here, right? As I explained earlier, Kubernetes is a service orchestrator in a cluster. It um, provides you, uh, OpenShift is Red Hat's distribution of Kubernetes, so I use it as a, in synonym here, although like technically Kubernetes is kind of the kernel of OpenShift and then there are other services around. Um, so OpenShift gives you, you know, and extends Linux to give you kind of a service application-centric deployment model across clusters, right? It, it, it abstracts from the underlying hardware. It takes care of connectivity of applications in that cluster, right? Between the application, how you get to the application. It has application lifecycle management. So it has, it's, it's a cloud platform in that sense that it gives you this uh, elasticity and service-centric or application-centric view. Um, applications are portable because they're defined independently of the underlying infrastructure, right? And even, so the portability can happen, again, like in traditional Linux on two levels. Like if you have the same hardware architecture, it will inherit the binary compatibility and you can take your, your multi-service application definition and deploy it in parallel to multiple places. Um, I think we, you know, we had a workshop yesterday to deploy a whole, um, the, the data hub, uh, data aggregation and, and machine learning stack. Um, and it's basically a one click deployment of like a you know, 13 service stack. Right? So you get this abstraction that's possible with OpenShift and the portability of the full service where you don't have to be an expert on every individual piece. Um, and um, the, the interesting piece here is that like so so you get these prepackaged services right so we have um, the ability for third parties and we, we we work with many third parties that define applications um, themselves consisting of multiple services and um, you can put them up and um, you know the end customer can then consume them 
in a way that's compatible or comparable to how you consume things in the public cloud. But you can take them wherever you want, right? So you, you get basically, instead of having documentation how to install things, you get the higher aggregation of the full orchestration model down to like pre-encoded um, scaling rules and things like that in the cluster as an application you can provide. Right? So that, that gives us the ability to create the integration and the time to value that you see in the public cloud independent of where you run it. Right? Um, and the key here is, is the ecosystem, obviously, right? So, so you need, um, uh, need prepackaged services available from many vendors in order to have the same number of services available that you would have in the public cloud. Um, so we, we, we end up with kind of two ecosystems here. One is, one is component level. It's a download to, to build. So as a developer, I want to download some Java package or an NPM, and I write my code. And that goes into kind of the application lifecycle management. But in many ways, in many scenarios, I just, don't, I just want to download a predefined service that I just want to operate without having to be an expert in doing it, like I want a database, right? I want um, I want storage, um, I want a message bus, I want uh, Kafka in there, right? That was one of the things we deployed in, in that service. So, um, so it's it's prepackaged services that go beyond the traditional binary to the full spec of the operational parameters of that service and make it easily consumable, like you would in the public cloud. Um, and, and so this gives you, a, it's, it's basically an open alternative to the same model. Um, and it gives you a standardized operational model, which, you know, so, so, you know, at this point, I should have put checkbox in there, right? So, so at this point, what we solved is we have solved the service abstraction, right? We, we can package full services, make them consumable very easily. Um, we manage the time to value there. Um, what we haven't managed yet is the operational excellence, right? And, and the standardization of operations that you see in Amazon, right? If you follow the Amazon path, you know you're following an industry best practice. Um, and, and, you know, there, there are like interesting uh, uh, discussions. It's like, you know, in, in OpenShift, we have a trend to immutable infrastructure, for example. So right now you can, right now you can take, uh, you can install RHEL and you can install OpenShift on top. Um, there is a discussion whether that should still be supported going forward or whether you should just have, in, have a, a, a core OS immutable host and you can't even log into that anymore because usually when you want to log into your host on an OpenShift thing, you want to do something that's not the best practice, right? Because the best practice is encapsulated in what Red Hat provides you. It's, it's a debate, but... Um, you know, in Amazon, if you go the Amazon way, you automatically follow a best practice. And um, we, are try we think that with Kubernetes, we can create a standardized operational environment that allows you to then, um, sh you know, well, uh, just the same things operate in the same way, independent where you run them, right? With the operator model, um, we are encapsulating operational aspects of an application with the application. So, um, uh, for example, if I'm, I'm, I'm a database provider, right? I, I ship a database to my customer, I write an operator for that, that operator encapsulates upgrade procedures and backup procedures for that database, right? So, um, so that the customer doesn't need to create custom backup rules, for example, or custom upgrade rules. Um, it's like, you know, in, in Windows there always was a service called HSS, uh, um, v VSS, uh, Volume Shadow Service, and it's, it's an interesting concept, right? I, I used to work at a backup company for a, a, a brief time, and on Windows, you could, um, when you wanted to back up a Windows instance running Microsoft SQL Server in a VM, you basically had the thing that just said, oh, I want to back that up, and then VMware, you know, in the VMware thing would like go to the the service in Windows and say, hey, "Are you going to be backed up?" And the Windows server VSS would tell the SQL server, "Oh, you're going to be backed up." The SQL server would flush its buffers, pause. VMware would take a snapshot of the machine of the data, and then say, "I'm done with the snapshot," and the service would restart. 
right? So it, you, like there was no custom script in that, it just was in the system, right? Look at operators as a way to standardize that for services, as, as it, they do operators do other things, but that's one example, right? The application vendor will set the procedure how to do the backup. And that becomes basically a standardized model so that uh, you know, if, if you want to back up your data, you know, the system will take care of making sure that it's clean at the point where you can then take the snapshot. Right? Um, and so th that's what we mean with standardized operation model. There's another uh, part of that. It's, um, it's, I have two more slides, so, and then we go to questions. Um, so, um, so we're standardizing metrics with Prometheus and Famous, and um, you know, for many things, <laughs> sorry, for many things that, that um, you're trying to do in these clusters, um, y y y you want to presently be able to um, drive application behavior based on metrics for the full cluster. Right? And so that's another, so, so standardization of how we meter things, how we aggregate logs, how we uh, look at, for example, performance is another aspect of this standardization of the operational environment. And then with Kubernetes, you already have a standard way to enact action, right? So, uh, you know, so there are, there's an API for everything, for every action. And so you can automate things on top of these AI. So we have the way to have a standardized model on how to do actions, right? Gather data and then do actions. And um, so on top of that, what Red Hat is doing, we have a service called Insights, which basically aggregates information from multiple customers, learns from it, and then gives guidance to customers based on that. Um, so today, it primarily uh, does it for configuration data, so it will tell you whether the configuration you have is bad, right? It's just wrong, you know, it's a, or suboptimal configuration, or it can tell you, oh, it was this configuration, it can relate to issues we have seen with other customers, so, you know, customers with this specific configuration ran into this specific problem and will warn you proactively about that. You know, last summit, we demoed a service where it would look at some of your configurations and say, oh, you're an outlier. All, you know, 99% of our customers have this configured differently. And by the way, your performance is off too. Right? Uh, we recommend you change the setting. Right? So the idea behind that is that, um, so in a way, like if you look at what Red Hat's role traditionally is in open source, and, and you know, similar to other open source companies, is that we we aggregate knowledge in how to maintain the software, provide the stability, aggregate knowledge on how to fix the software, and so that if you run into a problem, if you're a Red Hat customer, you call Red Hat and you have a high trust level that either we already have seen the problem with another customer so we can address it for you, you know, we maybe already provided a, a fix if it's a software problem, or we are able to identify the problem and then fix this and then solve it. You know, it's already solved for the next person. And basically, th that's always been the model. And now we are taking this model and automating it by aggregating observ observations from customers, learning from them and providing guidance back. So that's, um, the idea behind that is that we can provide some of the operational experience, right? the operational excellence that you see with these big um, with the big cloud providers or very large IT departments, and we can make that a shared experience for our customer base right? and grow, grow that. And so the system will help you. It will have uh, uh, basically a guidance system to help you um, achieve the same operational excellence without having to have the expertise always in-house. And, and that's you know, usually correct performance, reliability, stability, and uh, well, co correct behavior of the application, reliability, stability, security, and performance. Right? That's the things you care about, and that are all things that we can, um, we can solve to a large degree with this guidance system. Then the second piece, the next step, is self-driving clusters. Right? So, um, so putting AI into, so into the system. Right? So the, the first the guidance model is possible without the standardization, of course, but it becomes much more effective if you have a standardized operational environment because you, you so if, if you, if you, so insights on traditional RHEL is helpful, but of course limited because each deployment is too different 
So you cannot always make the same conclusions. When you go to the model where, um, where you have a standardized operational environment with immutable infrastructure, right? every host is the same, every open shift is the same, their parameters are different, but they are observable and they are in a controlled environment, suddenly we, can, um, we, we have a high probability that something we observe in one customer applies to the other customer as well, right? or we can measure the differences. Now, we, it, with a standardized way to measure all of this and a standardized way to act in an act change, we can also try to automate that change, right, the action. And that enables us to do self-driving clusters. So we put, learn, you know, we put you know, predict, uh, predictive um, statistical systems and machine learning models in there to learn from behavior and then automatically react to it. And it starts out very simple, right, with just anomaly detection and things like that. So it tells you, oh, you know, something unusual happened, right, or alert filtering, right. Um, but it progressively will get more and more interesting, right, from predicting behavior or optimizing, uh, uh, optimizing placement. Um, we will be able to, for example, direct uh, service calls, right. So you can, you know, you can... Um, if you, if you have, we have the standardized monitoring, so we can monitor the full stack, right, up to an application. Now we can measure the efficiency of an application down to how much CPU heat does it generate, right? Um, so I, I met someone who, who wants to do that for machine learning itself, right? So how do you know a machine learning model is good or not? It, you can, of course, you know, there, are, there are hard factors like um, how well does it predict, right? How, how, how correct is the outcome? But you can also look, oh, one uses much more energy than the other one, so maybe we go with the one that uses less energy, because that's a factor I care about. Right? So I can monitor things in the whole stack, or service um, routing. You know, I can uh, see machine load, and I can co push calls um, for my application to another node, because I have, the, you know, I have all the knobs to do that. And we can do that intelligently with you know, learning from the behavior of the specific environment. So that's the ideas behind that. So you know, basically, in, in many ways, take the concept of self-driving car and apply it to a much simpler problem, self-driving clusters, um, which will help self-driving cars because you know, it's a data center, so you don't want a sysadmin in the trunk. Right? Um, OK, it's a cheap joke. Uh, Anyhow, so, so, right, so the, 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 you know, the, 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 the storyline, you know, summarizes, like, so Linux's historic role is to be this neutral runtime, right, OpenShift does that for the modern cloud world as an extension of Linux. Um, the key values that drive cloud adoption are service abstraction, time to value, and operational, uh, operational excellence and the availability of services. And we think that we can get uh, to a place with a hybrid ecosystem to provide the same. Um, and then with the standardized operational model we see there, um, drive the oper you know, provides the operational excellence through aggregate data aggregation, observation, and guidance services and putting intelligence into the platform itself. And that's possible like, because, you know, because of Linux, Kubernetes, and then adding machine learning to it. Any questions? This might take care of the, let's say, technical aspects of the average IT running like an Amazon. Yeah. Uh, what about the soft parts of how do you teach an average IT folks to behave, do things the way Amazon Take away root. <laughs> but there's a, so we, we joke, right? Like, so there's a, the, it's like, so we, we should change our pricing model. And that is a joke, right? I mean, the CTO office disclaimer, nothing I say can construe to a product announcement, right? Nothing I say is anything like that. But, the, but the, the, you know, someone had the idea, well, well, we should like charge more if you want a root account on your, on your hosts. Right? Because it immediately means you're doing something that's non standard. Um, I, I think it's a cultural change, right? But I think I, I really like so. I really see the analogy to self-driving cars, right? Which and my you know I, my wife has a, has a model Tesla Model Three that from time to time I'm I'm allowed to drive, um, and it, it's really fun. So I'm like I'm on the highway in autopilot mode. It has like it's like it's not fully autonomous, but 
you know, I'm not steering the car and I'm driving, well, in Massachusetts, let's say 65 on the highway. <laughs> um, right, so uh, 65 miles per hour, I, I can't, you know, it's 100 kilometers per hour or something, something above 100, 110 or so. And, uh, and the car is steering on its own in full traffic. So, and, and, and that's, that's a behavioral change. But, um, uh, you know, it, it just, the, you know, uh, the car, like, I don't have to worry about anything, right? Especially, like, in stop and go driver or, like, or that type of, like, it just breaks for me and it's much better that than I will ever be. It has a LiDAR and radar uh, feature that look like three cars ahead. So it breaks already before I realize that the cars before me are braking. And like, I, think, I think once we have these guidance systems in, in place and, and we have automatic optimization, it's going to be a self-controlling model. There's a talk, I think that was yesterday on Thoth. Was it yesterday? Yeah. So we are out of time. So last sentence. So we, we, we are looking at that also for content guidance. So, so this was the operational side. But when you write your own software, you, you use all these stack components from somewhere. And it's the same problem, right? How do you know which version of what will work with which version of what? And um, so we have a guidance model for that as well. And we think that it will basically lead people to, to the mainstream, right? People will go to the best practice as soon as they have a realistic ability to learn what the best practice is. And then people will break out of that only if they have the real good reason to do so. All right, I hope this was uh, interesting.